Coming up, the Brooklyn Nets find new and exciting ways to disappoint the fan base, this time blowing a 10-point fourth quarter lead to the San Antonio Spurs. We break it all down coming up next. You are Locked On Nets, your daily Brooklyn Nets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Ah, yes, my friends, it is the Locked On Nets podcast right here on the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team, the Brooklyn Nets, every single day. Over there's Doug Norrie. I'm Adam Marbrick. We thank you, as always, for making us your first listen of the day. We are 100% free on all those great platforms. And tell you that LinkedIn Jobs helps you find qualified candidates that you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NBA. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions, they do apply. And there were terms and conditions, Doug, to this game for the Brooklyn Nets. Apparently, they had to lose. They needed to lose. And darn it, they found a way to get the job done. Well, buddy, they did it. Uh, against all odds, they've now run the tanking team gauntlet in that they have lost to every team that is trying to also lose this season in order to improve their draft pick and their draft stock going into this year. Nets have walked into each one of those wanting and trying to win and mm -hmm. have ended up losing. And the Spurs were the last one on the docket here that they needed to take care of because the Nets have already lost to the Blazers twice. They lost to the Hornets twice. They lost to the Wizards. They lost to the Grizzlies. They lost to the Pistons. They were able to lose to the Jazz. They lost to the Raptors. And the last one on the list was the Spurs. And they walked into Texas on Sunday night and they got the job done. Up 10. No, 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 no. We're going to take, we're, we're going to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory and make sure we clean sleep, clean, clean sweep this bad boy. And now they have lost to every other bad team who, by the way, as a reminder, are trying to lose where the Nets are not. I don't know how you hold up the uh, the you know, tankathon bingo card, but like we got it, baby. Come on now. What do I win for the sweet raffle here? And, and it's funny too, not funny, not funny, because you think about going into this game and wondering how do you get yourself from from a talent standpoint. It, it really is as bad as this team has been and their record, and we'll talk about that. It really, on paper, should almost be impossible to be a team with the talent they have on their roster to blow a 10-point lead with six minutes to go, to go to overtime. And frankly, as shocked as you are that they blow the lead, you then remember why you shouldn't be shocked that they blow, that they blew the lead. And then you remember how there's no chance they're going to win that game. Because this has not been a team that, by the way, in their many ebbs and flows, has those moments where they give it away and then also rip it back. Like they are pretty much the team that once things start to go sideways, you can kind of go ahead and set your watch to it. It's not going to, this is no auto correct. The ship does not get back on course. They go into the overtime against the Spurs and what it ends up being a 12 to seven ends up being the margin of loss there, including actually being up in the overtime and still finding a way to come out on the losing end. Yeah, they were 12 to 5 in overtime, scored five points in five, five minutes yeah. of overtime. Um, well, that's yeah, right. Why? Because the one bucket you thought you were getting was Cam Thomas, but no, Wemby went ahead and gave you that little rookie magic pinning that block against the backboard. Yeah, what a block by Wemby. Um, yeah, and overall, it's like one of these games where it's one loss on the on the on, on the dock or one loss on uh, on the uh, I can't I'm losing my train of thought here. Correct. This team's so bad. Uh, it's one loss in in the standings, <laughs> right? And you and you say to yourself, okay, well, you know, are, are there takeaways or the things that happen or like, oh, it's just one game. But the thing is, it's endemic of like everything that's happened here. And each yeah. time you think the Nets have hit a new low, uh, the graph continues to somehow trend lower. They have to keep, they have to continue sort of adding new parts to the bottom of the graph because you're like, oh, they just hit the new low here. No, oops, no, no, they didn't. They're able to, you know, up be up 10 against one of the worst teams in basketball and able to lose games again that they're trying to win because they, they're going to, and we're, we might even we actually there's a there's a world where they haven't even hit it here because they might go through the whole season and they might just like spike a huge pick to the Rockets. Now, I guess, you know, that's money that's already been spent, so you can't really do anything about it. But it's just one of those feelings like, oh, my goodness. Right. Like we might get to the off season and realize that the low hasn't even come yet because right. we're going to watch them convey some super high pick, even in which everyone loves to tell me as much as they possibly can how bad the draft is. It doesn't matter. The Nets would die for one of these picks if they it's were being so intellectually honest. Yeah. Uh, so it, But this game, too, it just is one of these things where you just shake your head. And 
we've seen levels of sort of demoralization around the fan base, honestly, even around like people that write about the team. It's gotten really pretty, pretty rough here. If you're still hanging around, you know, we're watching the games every single night. And it's just one of these things where you just sort of wonder, like, I mean, have we seen the worst yet? I, I'm not really sure. And there's p- the pieces that we can point to in this game, which are baffling on an in the moment basketball level and just like an organizational level, because there just seems to be so much disconnect with what's happening. Yeah. It's frankly alarming from a basketball perspective. Including, obviously, talking about the Cam Thomas late game situation, which we'll get to coming up here. But, oh, by the way, just to kind of tie a bow on this, listen, in the last six games, the Brooklyn Nets, talk about, like, losing to the lowest of the low, they lost to Detroit and Detroit. They lost to Charlotte and Charlotte. They somehow went to Cleveland and won a basketball game. Can't figure that one out. 19. Well, everyone was out. Mitchell and Mobley, half their team wasn't there. (laughs) I can can tell tell you how they did it. Half that team for Cleveland being out is still probably a better team than some of these other ones, regardless, right? So you get that give gimme game, I should say. Then you go to Orlando and lose. Good team. They're in the playoffs, whatever. You lose to the Pacers, and then you lose to San Antonio. You've lost to three of the worst teams in the last six games alone, not even that you've done it over the course of the year. And when you project forward now, like we had that conversation about, well, you know, you'll win some of the, against these bad teams, and then you'll lose against the good teams. The Pelicans are coming up. The Bucks are coming up. The Knicks are coming up. Even the Raptors are coming up. Remember that time when we talked about them being the same boat? Like, they're not. We're not. It's not. Like, this team... Since, by the way, over the last three months, and I did it, why? Because it's like the perfect date. Since December 17th, this team is 13-30. and 30. That is tied for the exact same record as the Portland Trailblazers, and that's tied for fourth worst in the NBA. San Antonio's 111. Detroit is 110. A victory came against us, and then you have the Washington Wizards. Like, that's the other thing here, too. And this game signified it to me. You cannot tell if these players know which way they're, they're they're coming or going here. Sometimes they're bought in, sometimes they're checked out. And sometimes you see it seemingly happen over the course of a game. They are among the worst team record-wise over the last three months in basketball. And to your point, there's a wor- you're just going to keep dumpstering your way to the bottom. And whatever we thought the basement was, by the end of the year, it could actually look even more alarming. And that matters relative to what this roster is and what this organization has said the roster is going to be going forward. They've badly, I mean, I was going to say this to the end, but I'll just say it now. They've badly, mis- I mean, badly, badly, badly misevaluated what they have. It's um, to a staggering degree. I, th- this yes. has been such, has been by Sean Marks. This, it starts with Marks now. Um, there's no other place to lay the blame at this point. Um, they've gotten rid of everybody else who you could have blamed. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, like, like everyone else is gone. I, there's all the stars are gone. You replace them with other players and packages. You replace the coach multiple times. You've done all this different stuff. Um, and I, even for a world where it's like, oh, you know, this is the gap year and they're going to be, but they treated this like a gap year where they wanted to win, right? Because yeah. if they understood, like, so they've com- they complete, even if you give them the benefit of the doubt that they understood that this was sort of an in between timeline, right? They've even, they've misevaluated their own, ta- their talent along those lines so badly. I mean, so badly right? They stink. They stink. And there's no world where they thought the team was going to be this bad. There's just no, there's no way. There's no way. Right. Because if you thought your team was going to be this bad, you would have done other things like trade, like really entertaining trades for some of these other guys, really stripping it down because you it's, how are you becoming an attractive landing spot to their team? I think they thought that they would do this like D low, 2.0 right like that right. that right. those those teams like the D-Lo, dinwiddie harris allen group um that got to the play jared dudley that got to the playoffs it looked great on paper from like a culture standpoint and they were going to kind of put this together like a bunch of kind of you know high level role players that were going to you know be more than the sum of their parts it's been so much less and now I just don't think they even know. They don't know who the good players in the team are. They don't know what systems they should be running. They don't know who should be playing <laughs> like late we'll games, which too. we'll talk about next. Yeah. Like, and they've just done such a misevaluation. I can't imagine like even a fan base has been lower. If you just kind of head around the, the fan base streets here, it's you can't get lower. People just have tuned them out. People just tuned them out. That's the opposite of love isn't hate. It's indifference. This yeah, and people and are becoming you- indifferent to this team. 
And, and I think you framed it perfectly there. What they perceived this to be was a scrappy team that, you know, totally. back into the playoffs, nice little narrative, and then we'll figure it out in the off season. Instead, they're among the worst, and it looks like it could be getting even worse before it's all said and done. Coming up next here, let's talk about a narrative we thought was dead. Cam Thomas playing in the game late when it matters most, and you need three pointers. Why bother using one of the best on your roster? We'll get into that conversation coming up next. All right, before we get to that, I'll tell you about our friends over at Stitch Fix. Look, if you want the instant confidence boost you're going to get from an outfit that makes you look really good, Stitch Fix is the absolute answer. And it answers the other problem, too, of like when you can even go to the store to find some of the clothes that you want. Don't worry about it. Stitch Fix is going to get you a personal stylist. They're going to understand your style, your size, your budget. They're going to do all of the shopping for you. Ship it your way. You try it on. You see what works for you. You see what doesn't work for you. You keep what you like. You send back what you don't. You wash, rinse, repeat. It's all there for you with Stitch Fix. You can easily upgrade your wardrobe this year with a professional stylist. They're going to help you find new on-trend favorites that will work for you. You can take a quiz. It's going to identify sort of your style, and then they're going to figure out the things that are going to work best for you. If I had multiple Stitch Fix, Stitch Fix boxes come my way, the Flag and Anthem hoodies have barely come off since they've been there. It's been almost like a family event when the Stitch Fix box comes because they say, hey, Dad, the husband, they're getting new clothes. He's going to finally start looking his very best. This is what Stitch Fix has figured out for me, style that makes you feel as good as you look, get started today at stitchfix.com slash locked on. That's stitchfix.com slash locked on stitchfix.com slash locked on. All right. So as we continue our, what is somewhat a post game episode? I don't know, maybe a moratorium on the entire season for the Brooklyn Nets. We think inside of this game though, we're obviously over the course of the season, we said too, you run out of talking points after losses like this because everything does seem all too familiar. But this was a surprising one for me. Uh, care of Eric Slater, who had the post game uh, press conference coverage as well. So this was interesting. Here's a quote. That's definitely something that we'll look at going down the stretch again. Would have loved to have CT, Cam Thomas, in there. I'll take that one. That's Kevin Ollie, head coach of the Brooklyn Nets interim, who's acknowledging that maybe it's on him that Cam Thomas was not in the game down the stretch of this one. Thomas, to his credit, turned around and did say, I guess they felt it was the best lineup to get a three off. It was a good look. He just missed it. It is what it is. If he made it, we wouldn't be here talking about whether I was in the game. Credit to Cam Thomas for, for saying, good look, if it went down, it's all good. Because if I was Cam Thomas, and he, he's had moments like these, and, and I you don't need to try to win the PR discussion or narrative around yourself, but I would have said I don't get it. I don't understand why I'm not in the basketball game. I'm the best player on this team. I've made that very clear. Mikael Bridges cannot hold a candle to what I am for this team. I, I was shocked by this. You fired Jock Vaughn for perceptual reasons, maybe because it was a difference in between the way the front office and the head coach wanted to run this team. You put Kevin Ollie in as an interim head coach. How can another coach come in here and have a moment where he says, maybe not Cam Thomas when we need, when we need points, when we need buckets, maybe Cam Thomas shouldn't be a part of the equation for us. All right, buddy, sit back here because oh, uh, I'm going to just absolutely cook on this. Um, <laughs> you can take this segment off because I'm going to lose my mind. <laughs> so, Okay, I agree. I'm going to start with the part I agree with. They got a good look. The Cam Johnson look was fine. It was a good look from three. They could have yep. tied the game. It didn't go down. Fine. The play call seemed fine. It's what it represents. Yep. Name me another team in the NBA that will be down three and have their leading scorer for the game, who, by the way, has been the best plus minus guy on the team since his return from the ankle injury, not mm -hmm. even close, plus 28, barely anyone else is even in the positive. He's been the only guy that's won, they basically won all of their minutes, crushed their minutes since he's been back. Name me another team. I'm not even saying he should take the shot. Name me another team where he wouldn't be on the floor at the end of the game. You can't do it. It would never happen. It would never happen. Like it would never happen. Even if you drew it up for someone else, even if you drew it up for Mikhail or Cam Johnson or whatever, even just the gravity of having him on the court because he's a guy that could take a shot. Like, is yep. Dorian Finney-Smith taking a shot there at the end? Like, do you need the rebounding so bad that you need to have all these big bodies? Or do you want to put the guy who has 31 points on 12 or 23 shooting, again, is plus six for the game. Everyone else is basically negative except for De'Aaron Sharp. And he's on the bench. It would never happen. It would never happen. 
the fan base, some people are only confused by this because it happens so weirdly often with him that it's gotcha. become almost like shrug your shoulders time because you don't even know what's going on. What is happening here? How could this possibly be the case? Kevin Ali goes and says, you know, it's on me. Also partly says, it'd be nice to have him in. I mean, who's who's sending in the orders? Like the alien overlords that are like just <laughs> chucking down like, oh, the ping pong, the, the lineup ping pong ball generator just didn't spit his name out for the guys that we had to find. He's the coach. Like I, I, I get that the, I get that he kind of owned I mean, he did own it the, as being a problem at the end like that's on me and that's commendable I, he should like I I don't know how you would say it any other way it's so confusing it is among the most head scratching moments and I want to be really clear I'm not asking him to take the shot I'm not asking him to be the first look even like got mm -hmm. a good look you would not go through any other team in the league for like NBA history. And tell me a player who was the leading scorer when you were down three. It was a guard, by the way. Like <laughs> that would be on the that would be on the bench mm -hmm. for the final play of the game. It's lunacy. It's lunacy. Yeah. Like how I, I I just sorry. So anyway, I'll finish no. this rant. I'll finish the rant by saying this signifies Nets fans like darkest fears around the organization's yeah. wishy washiness with a guy who's even if you are ascribing like his faults to him as part of the game, he's not a perfect player. We've been through this many times. Even if you, even when you factor those things in, <laughs> it makes no sense. It makes no sense. And it is, it's like so perfect. And I'm putting perfect in quotes. It's so perfect for how the rest of the season's gone. Cause just like, of course he wouldn't be on there. Why? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Yeah. Not even the coach. Like not even the coach knows. So anyway, rant <laughs> as over. You, as you said, as you said in there, and those, this is this is. I think you, we were vocalizing exactly how this fan base feels. If by the way, you're still fully engaging with these games, because we've heard some from some fans that are saying, "Listen, I, I haven't watched in two weeks. Why? For these exact moments. Because even if you chose to tune in to get that response, so the Kevin Ollie piece of it, like you say, is it good that he that he took it? as opposed to maybe give the Jock Vaughn, you know, weird psychedelic trip narrative around what's going on and how all these moments conspire and things that we're trying to do or accomplish or achieve that aren't related to winning basketball games. Sure. But also he's the only guy that's setting the line up there. So it, it, it I don't know. You'd rather hear him say like, I don't know. I, I honestly, guys, I can't even justify it. I can't believe I didn't put him in the game and it'll never happen again. But instead it's like, yeah, I wouldn't have minded having him in there. I, I should really look into that. And the overall narrative for this organization, it, it, that's the fine point you put on there at the end that this further cements what seems to have gotten exposed and re-exposed and overexposed all year long. This organization is all over the map and there is no concept that they are finding the way forward here in, in what has been a disastrous season. And you're only actually getting more evidence that they know less and less about what they want to be, who they want to keep, how they're going to correct this and what the path forward is going to look like coming up here in a second. I will tell you why the narrative has changed around Sean Marks for this podcast. We once perceived him to be Teflon. Now, now officially has holes poked throughout it, and there is seepage coming through that suggests this guy needs to be gone this offseason as soon as possible. We'll get into that coming up next. All right, before we get to that, I'll tell you about our friends over at LinkedIn Jobs. Look, if you're hiring for your small business, you got to find quality professionals that are right for the role got to check out LinkedIn jobs has all the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster. And you'll love this for free. LinkedIn isn't just another job board. It's a vast network of more than a billion professionals. Makes it the best place to hire. Gives you access to professionals you can find anywhere. LinkedIn does all that while making the process easy and intuitive. It's hiring super easy when you have the right quality candidates. So easy. In fact, 80%, 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing so many hats. You know, might not have all the time or the resources to hire. They're always looking for ways to make the process easier. 2.5 million small businesses use LinkedIn for hiring. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on MBA. That's linkedin.com slash locked on MBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply.
Welcome back in to what is a really fun episode for the Locked On Nets podcast. Don't forget to join us over on YouTube and turn on the alerts, obviously, and head over to WeGotNets.com. Get those five stories in five days, free ebook just for signing up with your email. Also got some new exciting things coming over there very soon. WeGotNets.com, five stories in five days, free ebook just by signing up with your email. Get it today. Now, here's the thing. First of all, I want to note that the word seepage, it was an odd choice. I think there's other things that I could have gone to frame that, you know, just, just maybe saying he's not Teflon anymore. And, and now his job security is at risk, but we went with seepage and we're going to stick with it. There's things seeping all over Sean Marks and his potential job status here, because you and I, and we've said this before, whether it was when Steve Nash was the head coach and what it meant for him to be the figurehead, et cetera, with the superstars, when it was Jacques Vaughn, we tend to try to err on the side of, Listen, there are always extraneating circumstances around GMs and coaches and players and everything that we want to contextualize. But now with Sean Marks, something about this late game sequence with Cam Thomas. So it goes to Kevin Ollie and you go, I don't know what the heck he's thinking there. But then I thought, well, what was Sean Marks thinking then to put to put this guy in charge? And it's not even a real knock on Kevin Ollie in totality, but you put this interim head coach in place. How have you not clearly established what it means for, Ke for, for Cam Thomas to be on this roster down the remainder of the season? And if you have established it, one of two things. Why isn't he following that narrative if you're Kevin Ollie? Or two, why have you not told him that Cam Thomas needs to be playing every game and playing closing sequences and getting developmental reps? It just feels like now we've said that he's made high-level misses and he's made done a lot of good things in the background. But starting with the trade deadline and the decision to keep Mikhail Bridges, keep Cam Johnson, all of these things, Dorian Finney-Smith, it's all trending the wrong way. And when we get to this offseason and we talk about a team that win total, TBD, I don't know how you can survive this, even if it's perceptual PR, whatever. If you are Joe Sy and you are remaining the owner of this team and you're not selling out to you know other buyers, you probably have to move on from Sean Marks here because this thing is going as off the rails as it possibly could. Even if the agenda was just being low level competitive for the playoffs, you can't sell. Well, we were the 11th seed. We almost made the play in tournament. It just doesn't matter anymore with the way these, this team is losing games. Yeah. Look, I mean the cam Thomas thing aside, I, like, I mean, they have leaned into, I will say they have leaned into him. And he's taken like easily the most shots on the team. So yeah, I think like, there's sure. not like a, there's not a problem there. I think mostly the, the failing here with Marks is that, one, he's again like one of the last guys standing, right? He's everyone else is gone through this tenure of like multiple year tenures. He's on different iterations of players, different iterations of coaches at some point. And maybe it's like, well, you sold a vision of like a 2025 timeline because that's when another super superstar is gonna shake loose. Uh, maybe that's maybe that's the sure. whole sales, maybe that's the whole sales pitch. It's like we're gonna have a lot of cap space and wait to see what I put together. And go ahead. I'm because I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna give the the antithetical side of this, but God, no, just because then I think the curious question would be like, do you think, cause we've heard this before across sports, would it have just been okay to sell that narrative that like, you don't, you don't know I mean? Like I, it does not, not that you need total transparency and honesty from an organization. You don't expect that, but just the idea of, Hey, we have a vision going forward and it is going to take us time, but we believe in where we're going to get instead. They made the choice of saying, we're going to compete. We want to be a playoff team. You set the premise, right? You set the premise for how your fan base should look at this team and this roster and expectations, and then you've grossly underachieved it. Like So at a minimum, it's also just bad PR work to set a narrative yeah, yeah. and goals that you can achieve on, right? It's bad PR work. And so this is the problem, right? It's bad PR work plus bad evaluation because like yeah. they... I get why you wouldn't be like, Hey, we stink. See you in two years. You can't, it's like, that's all you can't really do that for the fans and tickets and all this other stuff or for the current players. So I, I get why. And they kind of have, you know, they have hinted that this is the plan. So I think they tried to sort of like walk this middle ground. The problem is that even the understanding of that has a limited patience level. When you realize one, you've sort of misevaluated the talent that they even did have. Cause they're not even being really competitive. They're not competitive with this group at all. Right. right. Um, and two, the like, sort of like you've done everyone around here, such a disservice by miscasting everybody into these roles of which they might not like ever recover from um, like, just from, like a, a standpoint of like outside looking in like we th the reason we said they didn't think they'd fire Jacques Vaughn is because you would put the next coach in a terrible spot well that's that's what's happened with Ollie like Guess he's got all the all the same problems it's, it's actually played out exactly like we said it was going to for the exact reason I didn't think they'd fire Vaughn is that yep. it was like 
what are they going to do? They're going to put this guy in a terrible spot. It's going to be really hard to win. And guess what happens? They put him in a terrible spot, and it's really hard to win. It's it's like it's exactly what we said. Then you've miscast Bridges into like this like sort of you know superstar elite build around guy that other stars will want to play with. He stinks in the short term. He stinks. Like I I don't I feel bad for him. I think he's had he's been completely miscast. But even even factoring in being miscast, the numbers are are, are alarmingly bad. Yeah. Like he doesn't he's not getting up any shots. He can't get shots off against bigger wings. I sh- stinks is too bad. I shouldn't have said he stinks. He doesn't stink. Um, he stinks relative to the expectations. That 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 yeah, is correct. He's being, yeah, he's being misidentified and um, where he should be in the hierarchy of the team. Rather, if you put him in his role, if he was playing in his right role, then he'd be doing exactly what. Yeah, you I feel bad for saying stinks. So if anyone's yeah, yeah, gonna yeah. get on me about that, I'm apologizing for that. I, I that was that was the, that was the, caught in the heat of the moment. The he is well underperforming expectations. I think that is fair to say. So you've miscast him for a thing or for a role that he doesn't maybe can't live up to. You've we've already just went through the Cam Thomas piece. You put Ollie in a bad situation. They've done everyone a disservice here across the board to the point where that that eventually just falls on the GM. There's nowhere else for it to fall. And you can see it in these guys' faces. Like the the tenor of this team is so is so down. You sign Cam Johnson. He's underperformed that contract to a, he doesn't even start. He makes a hundred million dollars. He's not a starter, <laughs> right? Like but, there's all know, like good, there's for, all these, good for a bench player. There's all these, I mean, all these problems just go right down the line with this stuff. And at some point we've been, we've commended marks for a lot of moves. No other GM would still have the job. No other no. GM like that. Like they'd, they'd all be gone by now. And, and, and so here's the problem with it, I think, to close out. And by the way, I, I, we kind of knew that this was going to be the roadmap of this episode where it starts about, man, what a bad loss. That's a shame. And then just continues to get bigger and bigger and bigger because it is about larger narratives. My, my, my number one concern now is if he is still here in the offseason, he's not going to make the right tough choices, which would be, hey, let's get back to the table on Mikhail Bridges. Let's talk about Cam Johnson, you know, other teams, contracts, values, et cetera. It's going to be the erosion of the draft assets that you have to bring in better talented players to try to quickly get this thing back on track. And I just don't think that quote back on track is going to meet the expectations of the fan base or even the organization, because they're going to go and do things that put you back in the mix for the playoffs. And I, you know, mid tier playoff team, but they're going to think it's going to make them a top four seed. Maybe they'll be pushing for top three seed, but it's really going to be about being a six seed, maybe a seventh seed. And you're not going to be favored in playoff series and the age factor and all of those things around that core right now, it's all going to come home two seasons from now and you'll have no draft capital and you'll be sitting there staring at another eroded roster. And I, I it's so funny I, I, or miserable. You're going to end up bookending a mediocre season or two with really bad seasons, this being one of them. And then I think you're going to get one on the back end that you would think the organization is setting up to avoid and start getting consistent and start being competitive, but they're actually going to keep swinging this pendulum pretty violently here in the, in the foreseeable future until they get back control of their own draft capital. And that's years away right now. Yeah. It's just really, really hard to see. And now look, sometimes when you're in the, these positions of sort of like high level prognostication or just like organizational management, you have to make tough decisions. You have to do things that might not seem popular at the time. And you have to maybe stick by a vision and maybe the vision's there. And well, I'll, mea culpa time, if it, if it ends up coming around, it's just very, very difficult to see how big changes are made with the team in its current state. Right. And I think that's the biggest problem of like, it's, it's very hard to see the path to getting even incre- one, it's hard to see the path of getting incrementally better next year to start, mm-hmm. like just going to next year, like getting incrementally better next year feels like it's going to be a lot. You still have, still have Simmons on the table. We'll see what they do with the Claxton contract. Like, you know, there'll be some other money to maybe spend, but not tons. You know, the next year doesn't feel like the year that they're going to unload assets to like really improve. And then now you're two years away or a year plus away um, yep. in a relative unknown sort of hope my guess is like hoping that one of these other guy or two of them are just even available it might happen look it happened once i can see like it, it, it's not to say it can't happen again that's a lot to bank on that's just a lot to it's a lot to, to bank on maybe they know something we don't but when you couple that with an unexciting organization 
around the current on the court thing, it gets really hard to see. Again, go back to those, you know, those 2017, 18 teams, whatever with, with D'Lo. It was like, Hey, this is like a fun brand. They're, oh, they're outperforming expectations. We're in the playoffs, yeah. you know, you know, Jared Dudley's yucking it up, mixing it up with Ben Simmons. Like it's kind of fun. You kind of knew what the ceiling was, but that's okay. Like that's a version that you can talk yourself into growth. This is the opposite. They're not there. They're going, they're, they're underperforming expectations. And when that's the case, it's really hard to see why others would want to join. NBA yeah. landscape changes fast. What's true today is sometimes not true tomorrow. I, I get it. But this is the struggle I think Nets fans are having right now. And they have to, you would think they're have to be having it on the organizational level too. It, it, and I would say this, my last note would be, and we've said this, we've kind of alluded to this before, expect the Mikhail Bridges potential, you know, maybe I wouldn't mind being traded from here. Th those rumors and narratives are going to start to build up as this season winds down and you head to the off season because whatever's happened to the perception of what he should be or where he's playing at, he's not going to look at himself and maybe nor should he and the performances that he's been putting forward and think that it's just about him. He's going to look at this roster in totality, this organization in totality, and wonder if he'd be better off somewhere else. I do not think that we are that far away from that discussion as well. Yeah, and that's, I mean, again, that's like not sourced or anything. It's just kind of like, no, hey, no. Uh, like how long these guys, how long how long do players want to stick around in, 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 in sinking ships? It doesn't seem exactly. like it'd be forever. And like, Bridges seems like a good guy, and I doubt that would happen. I guess the fact that we're even putting it as a non-zero chance tells you the state of this organization. All right, we will be back again after the game on Tuesday doing some post-game there. Make sure you get check out We Got Nets. I get that for ebook. We're gonna have some other stuff coming. I think there's some merch coming here, uh, which we're pretty excited about. So make sure you go tune into We Got Nets. Just get the free ebook. If for nothing else, just get your name on the email list because we got something else coming down the pike. Success is a menace. It fools smart people into thinking they can't lose. That's Willie Gates. Oh, one of the all-time great poets. We're back again tomorrow talking more Brooklyn Nets basketball. Basketball, basketball.